Thank you so much, eh? <clears throat> Professor Sancho and Luis. And I'm very grateful to all of you for the invitation, which I accepted uh, very, very happily. And um, congratulations also for the program that uh, your university decided to put forward uh, in this uh, occasion. I will talk uh, uh, on the challenges of the ecological uh, transitions and the um, answers coming from the most recent uh, social Catholic uh, teaching, in particular, the teaching from Pope Francis. Let me start uh, from a few stylized facts. I will not uh, waste my time, which is, uh, as you know, limited, to describe the phenomena uh, regarding uh, climate change, uh, the environmental destruction, etc. Because I take for granted that all of you already know these uh, uh, facts. Let me only remind you very, very few stylized facts. The first one has to do with the report published very recently by the World Inequality Laboratory. Uh, the report is called the Climate Inequality Report. We read in this report that the North America in the last 50 years has contributed with a 27% of, to the total emissions. Europe comes second with 20, 22%, China 11%, Russia 9%, Latin America 6%, and Africa 3.8%. What does it mean? It means that when we talk about this issue, we have to take, we have to be serious. We have to consider what are the areas of the globe which mainly contributed, so to speak, to the phenomenon we are talking about. And second, we have to consider the impact of the fact that uh, affecting Africa, I'm referring to the migration, because the same report indicates that in the last 50 years, the global north, in the global north, the rate of productivity in agriculture has increased enormously. Whereas in the global south, the rate of productivity in agriculture has decreased. And so you understand the implication. The people in the global south, in particular in uh, Africa, they have not enough food to eat. And so that is why the migratory flows uh, uh, find uh, their explanation. It's not the only explanation, but it's one of the explanations. Finally, a third uh, stylized fact, and uh, that is uh, something uh, positive in my opinion. Last year, the so-called Club of Rome published a, a report called Earth for All. In that report, the proposal was put forward to introduce NAMEA. NAMEA is an acronym which stands for National Accounting Metrics, including environmental accounts. Now, the good piece of news is that January 31st this year, which means last week, the European Parliament has approved the so-called Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive. And now for applying to all the firms. And that is a major novelty. And I'm sure that something important will occur. Now we have to wait uh, today, February, the ninth, when the European Council should vote uh, that uh, proposal. Let us hope uh, that the European Council will vote in favor of that. Because uh, for those who are perhaps not uh, accustomed to this type uh, of language, that implies that every firm in any country, in of course, uh, in the European Union, so they have to publish every year a report indicating the amount of damages to the environment, air, 
water, uh, forestry, etc., which uh, occur. And that uh, you understand that it's a major step forward because until now, all the balance sheets uh, and the reports uh, produced by the firms, they never indicate, uh, let's say, the negative sides of their productive activity, etc. Now, to conclude, let me all on this, uh, let me mention the following. In all of this, a major responsibility is on the shoulders of economists, the profession to which I myself belong. We have to be honest. Honesty is important. Because economists, for the reasons that have no time now to expand, they have always undervalued until a few years ago, no more than 10, 15 years, the environmental issue. Because they always believed that nature would never put a constraint to the process of growth. And that was a terrible mistake. And to give you an example, consider the journal, which is called Quarterly Journal of Economics, which is one of the top five scientific journals in the world level. Well, in the last, uh, in the last 50 years, a, a number of uh, articles in 3,700 scientific articles were published in that uh, journal. Out of the 3,700 articles, only 55 dealt with the environmental and the ecological question. And that is a shame. It's a shame. Because, you see, last 50 years means uh, starting the 70s, when already the environmental problem, ecological problem was raised. At, and still, economists did not pay any attention. Of course, uh, there are few of them, but I'm referring to the vast majority of the group. Having said so now, the question then comes, becomes, what should be done? What should we do in now and looking towards the future in order to cope with the problem? Here, we have to distinguish two different approaches. One approach, which is still the dominant one, is still the dominant one, is the so-called optimization approach. And that uh, the other approach, on the other hand, is called the integral human development approach. And that is the approach uh, which was put forward by Pope Francis in Laudato Si, the famous encyclical Laudato Si, even though it was anticipated by Pope uh, Benedict XVI and also by John Paul II. But uh, the merit uh, to uh, finalize this discourse goes to Pope Francis. Now, let me characterize the two approaches. The optimization approach is the one dominant uh, both in the political circles and in the economic circles, which uh, says like that. We take, we have to acknowledge that natural resources and environmental resources are becoming more and more scarce and limited. So what we have to do is to optimize the available resources. What does it mean to optimize? It means that we have to introduce what today are called mitigation policies. This is an important word, mitigation policies. Just to give you a exam few examples, no waste. For instance, uh, garbage collection should be differentiated. Second, circular economy. Third example, the use of renewable resources, etc. In other words, the reasoning is the following. Given the fact that resource, these natural resources are becoming more and more scarce, we have to optimize their use. In concrete terms, what does it mean? It means that the objective function remains the same as before. What is changed is what we economists call 
the constraint apparatus, a typical way to formalize an economic problem according to mainstream economics is the following. Let us fix an objective function under constraint. So in, in the present case, the objective function remains the same as before, which is maximization of growth rate, the rate of growth. Growth of what? Of GDP, gross national product or gross domestic product, or if you want to use a more generic word, national income. That is uh, remains the objective function. What changes is, I repeat, uh, the constraint apparatus. In other words, we have to put limit. For instance, uh, we have to introduce carbon taxes. You know, the phenomenon. what does it mean carbon taxes? Inside the country and uh, at the international level country. Second, we uh, have to use uh, the markets uh, for pollution permit, which is uh, this system is uh, enacted in the European Union. What does it mean? It, it, this idea goes back to Ronald Coase, uh, who was an econ English economist who obtained the Nobel Prize in economics already many years ago. In a famous article published in 1960, Ronald Coase made, put forward the following proposals. We have a, a public authority, for instance, in this case, the European, Community, the European Commission. And every year or every other year, uh, there is a sort of a, a competition among firms to buy the permits to pollute. And those who, of course, of course, pay more, obtain the permit to pollute. And once they have acquired the permit to pollute, it is obvious that nobody can complain about that. The underlying idea was the following. If the price of these permits goes up, firms will be disincentivated from using certain type of uh, technologies, not only, but a firm can resell the permit to another firm in order to obtain a profit. Now, this system is still enacted, even though at a lower level than a few years ago. Why? Because the cause approach is a mistake, mistake, mistake. And it's uh, incredible that even top economists Nobel Prize winners, in particular America, did not realize that. Because uh, the cause theorem is valid under certain assumptions. We learned that in mathematics when we were young people. Any theorem starts from certain hypotheses. Okay? So the, the same is true in this case. But the, the hypothesis, in order to uh, guarantee uh, the cause uh, theorem do not apply in reality. That is why the market for permits. Second, there is a second, that we consider the environment, the entities, air, water, forestry, land, etc., etc., as if they were commodities like any other things. And that creates a problem from both the theological and the philosophical aspect. In other words, the idea underlying the cause theorem is uh, the following. Nature belongs to us, to us uh, human beings, and we have to exploit it, but in an intelligent way. Before, we were not intelligent in uh, exploiting it. We have to become a bit more shrewd in that. But the main concept is the same. Now, the other approach I was uh, referring a few minutes ago is an uh, integral human development approach. And that is uh, typical, typical of the Catholic social teaching. As uh, it is, uh, if you read the Laudato Si, already from the first pages, the point is. So let me clear a bit. What is uh, the difference? Uh, from 
let's say, a terminological point of view. First of all, in this approach, we talk about development, not about growth. That is the other terrible mistakes that most professors of economics continue to make teaching wrong things to their students, making them believe that growth and development are more or less the same thing. But this is a shame. Why? Because growth refers only to the material side. Even plants grow, even animals grow, but only human beings can develop. Because develop, if you look into the origin of the word develop, means liberating people from, uh, let's say, uh, uh, those impediments restricting liberty. So if you love liberty, you want to develop. If you do not love liberty, you can be happy enough with growth. So the notion of development, of human development, includes uh, three dimensions. One dimension is growth. Because growth is certainly important, but it's not the only dimension. There are the other two dimensions. The second one is the relational dimension. And the third one is the spiritual dimension. So a model of development has to be considered properly human if it is able to maintain the three dimensions in equilibrium. In other words, harmonizing the three dimensions. On the other hand, if you take the growth uh, uh, perspective, you only are interested in maximizing the rate of growth as measured, as I said before, by the uh, that parameter, which is called the GDP, forgetting about the other two dimensions. That is um, uh, the notion of integral. That is uh, the meaning of the word in integral means that the three dimension should go hand to hand. And so already from what I just said, you understand the difference between the two approaches. Second remark of this uh, approach uh, as uh, made by the Catholic social teaching. The basic idea is to treat nature and culture as two entities which have to make an alliance. That is the notion of the alliance between nature and culture. Because humanity, humanity is part of nature, it's not something else. And so if it is a part of nature, we cannot treat uh, nature this case, uh, environment, as if it were a commodity, according to the cause uh, theorem I was talking about before. That was the cultural mistake of that approach. Because that implies, I repeat, uh, that uh, nature is uh, something else that we human beings can utilize at our benefit according to what we want to. So the second point uh, or remark or pillar of the Laudato Si approach is that uh, the, it's a call to alliance. Nature and culture, culture means uh, what we human beings, uh, the way we organize uh, our society have to be. And that uh, this uh, alliance should be based uh, on the recognition that the uh, environment, nature, is a common good not a public good. Ask an, a, a, any economist, ask them, what's the difference between common good and public good? Most of them would say, oh, more or less are the same. My goodness, they are not the same. Because a public good, it's a good which a, a, a nation state or a government should take care of. A road is a public good. A motorway is a public good because uh, you have an authority, which could be the central government or the local government, never mind, which takes care of that. But common good, uh, common, has the same root as community. 
common good, it's a good belonging to the whole community, not belonging to an entity which is a, a national authority or whatever. So the, the second uh, point which uh, deserves our attention of the approach uh, put forward by Laudato Si is the re official recognition of the common good nature of environment. Now, let me, in this regard, remind you one aspect. I don't know if you know already that the word sustainability was coined, coined for the first time in 1713. Before 1713, the word sustainability did not exist. And do you know who coined it? A German. A German scholar whose name was von Karlowitz, Hans von Karlowitz. He was professor of forestry, professor of forestry. And he was asked by the Prussian government of the time to elaborate a model determining how many trees could be cut every year in order not to jeopardize the possibility of having a timber in the following years. Because in those days, wood was the fundamental element for construction, etc., etc. You know that. And so he elaborated a very, very intelligent and nice model. And for the remaining part of the century, the 18th century, that model circulated in Western Europe, circulated in different uh, circles, in different uh, university environments. But when we reached the end of the 18th century, it was put aside. Why? And you know from history, you studied history. What happened towards the end of the 18th century in Great Britain? The Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution needed what? Coal and iron. Coal, that is why the first industrial revolution occurred in England. Because England was very rich in terms of mines, coal mines and iron mines. And so it is obvious that the approach taken by von Karlovitz was put aside. Because the main target was to accumulate machinery machineries after year after year, etc. etc. Just to tell you very briefly the history of this concept. It is only in recent time, in the last quarter of a century, or perhaps 30 years, that the word sustainability has resurrected for the reasons that I mentioned at the beginning. I closed down, I shut down the parenthesis. A third element implying by the approach, the Laudato Si approach, is the so-called uh, uh, utilization of adaptation policies. What does it mean, adaptation? Before I said mitigation, so don't confuse mitigation with adaptation. Mitigation, I clear before, what does it mean? Mitigation means uh, uh, if you have a headache, you take a pill, an aspirin pill, and the aspirin pill will take away your headache. You understand the, the meaning of the method. That is mitigation. Adaptation policy means uh, changing the lifestyle. That is a point on which uh, the Francis uh, theologist is very continuous, continuously, day after day to see. What does it mean changing the lifestyle of people? means uh, considering that uh, the so-called neo-consumerist model is a real danger against the environment. Today, we live in the society of consumption. That is what sociologists have uh, called uh, this historical period. Because consumption has become, so to speak, uh, the, 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 the major uh, goal of, uh, of the people. To end overconsumption, it means uh, on one side the, the destruction of natural resources. It's considered a phenomenal waste, as I said before. On the other side, it means that uh, 
we tend to attribute our happiness, and happiness is a very important goal in the life of every human being, associated with uh, more and more consumption. In other words, you, you want to be happy, consume more. That is a mystification, which is, uh, as you can imagine, very, very dangerous. So what um, the adaptation policy means is that we have to change the lifestyle, which does not mean to de diminish the level of consumption. No, be careful. Eh? It means uh, to change the composition of consumption. In other words, uh, less consumption of private and public goods and more consumption of common goods, relational goods, care goods. You know what are care, care goods that today are so important, etc. And the cultural goods. So some people in the past, uh, they said, uh, you see, with the so-called the degrowth theory. No, that is not the proper way. Because the issue is not to diminish the level of consumption, but to, I repeat, to change the composition of consumption. Why should we continue to consume more and more goods which are of no use for our happiness and we do not consume those goods like relational goods, which are fundamental as a the whole literature all over the world nowadays uh, is able to indicate to us. The same is true, as I said, with cultural goods. Culture does not destroy the environment. <laughs> That's just the point. And uh, can you convince me that the, the use of cultural goods uh, is not important for the need that we have uh, of carrying along uh, a happy life? And the same is true with the care. Consider the situation, I don't know if you ever read the book by Angus Deaton. Angus Deaton is an American economist who obtained a few years ago a Nobel Prize in economics. So it's an outstanding figure. Angus Deaton. You know, he published four years ago in, uh, in America, a book which uh, made uh, a big bang. You know what was the title of that book? Death of Despair. Death of Despair. Since uh, I know him, when uh, I observed that his book coming out, I sent him a message. And they said, Dear Angus, congratulations for your book. You must have had a good courage, big courage. And he answered to me, yes, Stefan, my name is Stefan. You are right, because in America, they tried to convince me to change the title, because they said that the title is frightening, but uh, I insisted. And uh, if you read that book, uh, but read it uh, chapter by chapter, because otherwise uh, you run the risk of collapsing. It's uh, incredible. He says the country, which is the number one in terms of growth of income, income per capita, is the country where what he called the loneliness. The loneliness is dominant. And loneliness is a new disease, which has also major implication from the point of view of health. But why loneliness? Because we do not generate relational goods. Relational goods, for instance, friendship is a relational good. The family is a relational good. But if we destroy the family, and if we destroy all our social interrelations, it is obvious that we might become rich and richer, but we will feel ourselves always more and more sad. And when the things are written in a book by a Nobel Prize winner, and he indicates numbers, figures, it's not a simple, so to speak, a concept, a idealistic concept, people have to consider. So the idea of adaptation policy means that we have to adapt our 
not the standard of living, but the, the style of life to the new context in which uh, we, are, uh, we are located. A third point is to, and that is very, very important, to cope with the so-called uh, environmental trilemma. I don't know if you ever heard uh, this expression, which uh, is uh, spreading in the last few years. Environmental trilemma means that when we talk of sustainability, we have to consider three forms of sustainability. Environmental sustainability, social sustainability, and economic sustainability. Now, until now, no country in the world has been able to implement policies to maintain in a equilibrium these three dimensions. You can have policies which favor environmental sustainability and social sustainability, forgetting economic sustainability, or policies uh, maintaining social sustainability and economic sustainability, but forgetting about environmental sustainability. Think of a triangle. In a triangle, you have three vertices. So only two out of three vertices so far have been taken into consideration. Now, Catholic social teaching tells us that is the way. We have to put together the three dimensions. Just to give you an example, we observe the example in these days, in Europe, in Brussels, in Rome, in Berlin, said the tractors, the peasants, they complain because they said, look, of course, you want, you referring to the other uh, sectors of the economy, to want to protect the environment, but why we should pay for it, only we and not the others? You know, the same is true with uh, major uh, factories. It is obvious that if a factory closes down and starts to fire workers, in order to avoid the uh, pollution, the workers will say, what's going to happen to us, uh, to our family? Should we starve? Or, uh, these are the problems. That is why you, we will not, we should never separate the three types of sustainability. And that is the major uh, in, impulse coming from Laudato Si. That is why Laudato Si is highly respected by everybody. Not only by believers, eh? not only, but even by people from different religions. For instance, I've been told that, that the Muslim translated into Russian, the first to translate into Russian, the uh, in Russian language, the Laudato Si and Sikrika. And when I asked that to the Iman, he said, well, hey, because irrespective of the fact that Pope Francis is a, is a Christian, we understand that he is right. So that is the reason, because the Pope is speaking a language which fits the necessities of all human beings with no distinction in terms of geographical areas, etc. Et and finally, because I noticed that I'm finished with my time, so I have to respect the rule, so to speak. A fourth element, a which uh, is getting more and more attention even in recent times, is that if we want to cope with the problems of environmental sustainability, we have to end uh, the scandalous increments of inequalities, income and wealth inequalities, uh, which uh, have exploded in the last 40 years. And that is a serious problem. Believe me, because in the last 40 years, inequalities, which always existed, even in the past, but it's a matter of degree. It's a matter of degree. One thing is if you are level of riches, it's 10 and my is one. Another thing is if your level is 1,000 and my is one. So what I'm saying actually, not me, but Milanovic, 
Milanovic is uh, the chief economist of the World Bank. Very, very good person, very good. And he, he published recently a major piece of research where he indicates with actual data why in the last 40 years, the degree of inequalities among countries and within countries has increased tremendously. And so the Pope says, be intelligent enough, dear friends, dear brothers and sisters, because unless we stop the mechanisms generating inequalities, of course, uh, the environment will not be uh, so. The problems of the environment will not be so. Because when people are desperate and they are hungry, they destroy. They destroy the forestry. They destroy everything. So you can then blame them because they are hungry. That is about. so. This is a fourth element, is um, one which has been taken up in Fratelli Tutti, the other encyclical which was published uh, more recently, a few years ago. And if you take uh, chapter three and four of Fratelli Tutti, he, Pope Francis. Uh, uh, made more explicit at this point, that inequalities is a major cause of environmental degradation and of war. Because the wars, don't believe those people who teach us uh, uh, silly things. The point is that, uh, I'm not saying the only, but the, one of the major determinants of war is the economic factor, in a, particularly inequalities. Uh, that has always been even in the past, but today is even more. So to conclude, because I have finished my time, what I, I can say is uh, the following. Uh, the reflection on the uh, environmental question is going ahead. As you know, in the last COP28, uh, uh, a few months ago, which was uh, organized Abu Dhabi, and a small step uh, forward has been taken uh, from this point of view, as you know, because uh, a decision was taken to subsidize uh, the south and uh, the so-called uh, south, um, global south uh, in order to allow these countries to uh, invest uh, in new activities and new research projects. That in itself is a good idea, but honestly, we have to say that the money put in this, in this funds is almost like nothing. It's good for buying peanuts, but not to cope with the prior problem. But at least it has been admitted for the first time. And that's important. The Western countries, they took the courage to admit it's our fault. Our fault. And that is true. Those who deny that is because they are ignorant. They do not know. They do not know the history. And in particular, they do not know economic theory. And that is the point. But all today, major economists, like people like Joe Stiglitz uh, uh, and many others, etc., they admit and so if it is our fault, we have to help the other countries who are stepping behind to finance their transition. To conclude, should we be optimistic? About, of course, we should be optimistic because uh, what we need is a change of mentality which goes hand to hand with the change of our heart. Because what we do not need today is a technical, because we know from a technical point of view what should be done. Well, uh, science, sciences of various types, physics, biology, chemistry, they teach us what should we do. So it's not the lack of knowledge which we need, we need more. We know already what we need is to change our heart first and change also our brain, our mentality, etc. And that is the reason 
why it is proper to study the things and to do research in, along this line. I have finished my time, I stopped. I understand that we have a few more minutes. If there are any questions, please do not hesitate to, to externalize. I will be happy to contribute to the common discussion. Thank you very much for your attention.